I'm, I'm very happy to be invited again today. Thanks to Brother Julian and Richmond. Uh, I'll be sharing on Vitaka Santana Sutta. So when I was uh, preparing my lecture, then I thought, um, yeah, so uh, I was preparing my lecture, I thought maybe I should also um, connect it with a bit of uh, neurophysiology about stress management to make it more complete. So this is... Um, a Dharma talk, but there is a lot of worldly things. So do uh, recognize that uh, all the conventional truths here that I'm sharing are, are not absolute. You know, as uh, medical science further advances, there will be changes in our understanding. So all the signs that you're going to hear, uh, don't take this as a uh, noble truth. Okay? They are just conventions. Um, and then uh, then I'll share with you um, the Dhamma from all this. So the objective of this is to um, take inspiration from this particular sutta and see how we can apply to our daily, very mundane um, defilements that affect our well-being. So it's like mental health, you know. Uh, so, uh, but, uh, so we, but we will be using um, the Buddha's teachings apply in uh, worldly experience. So I'll start with just reading the sutta. Okay? So this is uh, translated by Soma Thera. Um, maybe I'll just read it. It's easier, you know. So, um, Vitaka Santana Sutta, the removal of distracting thoughts. Thus have I heard, at one time, the Blessed One was staying at Savati in Jeta's Grove, Anatta Pindika's Pleasance. The Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus, saying, Bhikkhus, and they replied to him, saying, Reverend Sir. The Blessed One spoke as follows. Five things should be reflected on from time to time by the bhikkhu who is intent on the higher consciousness. What five? When evil and skillful thoughts connected with desire, hate, and delusion arise in a bhikkhu through reflection on an adventitious object. He should, in order to get rid of that, reflect on a different object which is connected with skill. Then the evil and skillful thoughts are eliminated. They disappear. By their elimination, the mind stands firm, settles down, becomes unified and concentrated just within his subject of meditation. Like an experienced carpenter or carpenter's apprentice, striking hard at, pushing out, and getting rid of a coarse peg with a fine one, should the bhikkhu, in order to get rid of adventitious thought, reflect on a different object that is connected with skill. Then the evil, unskillful thoughts connected with desire, hate, and delusion are eliminated. They disappear. By their elimination, the mind stands firm, settles down, becomes unified and concentrated just within his subject of meditation. If the evil and skillful thoughts continue to arise in a bhikkhu, who in order to get rid of an adventitious object reflects on a different object which is connected with skill, he should ponder on the disadvantages of unskillful thoughts. Thus, truly, these thoughts of mine are unskillful, blameworthy, and productive of misery. Then, the evil unskillful thoughts are eliminated. They disappear. By their elimination, the mind stands firm, settles down, becomes unified and concentrated, just within his subject of meditation like a well-dressed young man or woman who feels horrified, humiliated and disgusted because of the carcass of a snake, dog or human that is hung around his or her neck, should the bhikkhu in whom unskillful thoughts continue to arise in spite of his reflection on the object which is connected with skill, ponder on the disadvantages of unskillful thoughts thus, truly, 
these thoughts of mine are unskillful, blameworthy, and productive of misery. Then the, the evil, unskillful thoughts are eliminated. They disappear. By their elimination, the mind stands firm, settles down, becomes unified and concentrated just within his subject of meditation. If evil, unskillful thoughts continue to arise in a bhikkhu who ponders on their disadvantageousness, he should, in regard to them, endeavour to be without attention and reflection. Then the evil, unskillful thoughts are eliminated. They disappear. By their elimination, the mind stands firm, settles down, becomes unified and concentrated, just within his subject of meditation. Like a keen-eyed man, shutting his eyes and looking away from some direction in order to avoid seeing visible objects come within sight. Should the bhikkhu, in whom evil and skillful thoughts continue to arise in spite of his pondering on their disadvantageousness, endeavour to be without attention and reflection as regards to them, then the evil and skillful thoughts are eliminated. They disappear. By their elimination, the mind stands firm, settles down, becomes unified and concentrated, just within his subject of meditation. If evil and skillful thoughts continue to arise in a bhikkhu in spite of his endeavour to be without attention and reflection as regards evil and skillful thoughts, he should reflect on the removal of the thought source of those unskillful thoughts. Then, the evil and skillful thoughts are eliminated. They disappear by their elimination. The mind stands firm, settles down, becomes unified and concentrated just within his subject of meditation. Just as a man, finding no reason for walking fast, walks slowly. Finding no reason for walking slowly, stands. Finding no reason for standing, sits down. Finding no reason for sitting down, lies down. And thus, getting rid of a posture rather uncalm resorts to a restful posture, just so should the bhikkhu in whom evil and skillful thoughts arise, in spite of his endeavour to be without attention and reflection regarding them, reflect on the removal of the thought source of those unskillful thoughts. Then the evil and skillful thoughts are eliminated. They disappear. By their elimination, the mind stands firm, settles down, becomes unified and concentrated just within his subject of meditation. If evil and skillful thoughts continue to arise in a bhikkhu in spite of his reflection on the removal of a source of unskillful thoughts, he should, with clenched teeth and the tongue pressing on the palate, restrain, subdue and beat down the evil mind by the good mind. Then the evil and skillful thoughts connected with desire, hate and delusion are eliminated. They disappear. By their elimination, the mind stands firm, settles down, becomes unified and concentrated just within his subject of meditation. Like a strong man holding a weaker man by the head or shoulders and restraining, subduing and beating him down, should the bhikkhu in whom evil and skillful thoughts continue to arise in spite of his reflection on the source of unskillful thoughts, restrain, subdue and beat down the evil mind by the good mind, with clenched teeth and the tongue pressing on the palate, then the evil and skillful thoughts connected with desire, hate and delusion are eliminated. They disappear by their elimination the mind stands firm, settles down, becomes unified and concentrated just within this subject of meditation. When indeed because evil and skillful thoughts due to reflection on an adventitious object are eliminated, when they disappear and the mind stands firm, settles down, becomes unified and concentrated just within his subject of meditation, through his reflection on an object connected with skill, through his pondering on the disadvantages of unskillful thoughts, his endeavouring to be without attentiveness and reflection as regards to these thoughts, or 
through his restraining, subduing, and beating down of the evil mind by the good mind with clenched teeth and tongue pressed on the palate, that bhikkhu is called a master of the paths along which thoughts travel. The thought he wants to think that he thinks. The thought he does not want to think that he does not think. He has cut down craving, removed the fetter, rightly mustered pride, and made an end of suffering. The Blessed One said this, and the bhikkhus, glad at heart, approved of his words. So this completes the sutta. So um, it's a lot of words, and I was reading slowly, but I am sure it's quite difficult to catch the gist. So very quickly, we just... Um, um, and also I'll explain a bit of the pictures. So this is, this is important when he says that um, the five things should be reflected from time to time for bhikkhus who is intent on higher consciousness. Higher consciousness traditionally means deeper and deeper jhana. So it's for people who are practicing samatha meditation to go deeper into samadhi. Of course, sometimes we have wandering thoughts, unskillful thoughts uh, related to the hindrances, desire and so on. So if this happens, the first thing you can do is to use a wholesome object to replace it. So if you're mindful on the breath or the skeleton, and you think of food or what you're going to do later, and then you keep thinking about it, the mind is very restless, you can replace the wandering thoughts back to your breath. So this is using this pack to remove that object. So this is the pack. Or you think of the Buddha, you, maybe like uh, you're very sleepy, you keep thinking of wanting to sleep. And then you replace that thought of sleeping, even though your mindfulness on the breath, but every time you're mindful on the breath, you get wandering thought of sleeping, you can replace it with Buddha no Sati. You know, think of the Buddha and the Itipiso Bhagavad Arahant. You think of the Buddha as the teachers of gods and men. You know? So this is the wholesome pack removing the unwholesome pack. But if it still doesn't work, this picture is about men dying. And this is a picture in the Abhidhamma about the Javanas. The Jays are the Javanas. So the idea of this is every time you have thoughts of unwholesomeness, of desire, of anger, and so on, every moment is millions of Javanas happen. Each Javana, the green color mind, is laden with karmic potential. So every unwholesome thoughts can potentially disrupt your mind when you're dying. You can be reborn in a bad place, even though you have been you know, very wholesome for a long time. So you can think about that, just like a young man or woman suddenly disgusted with a carcass around his neck, mm, throw away. Okay? Then you can go back to your breath or something. So this is the idea. If this still doesn't work for you, then you just let go. Don't pay attention to that. Yeah, sleepy, sleepy, never mind. Or you're meditating, somebody is blasting the music, you keep distracting to the music. All you do is just let go and just mindful on your breath. It's like the man shutting the eye. But if it still doesn't work, this is the theme of this particular sutta, Vitaka Santana Sutta. The, it's about going to the root of it and reflect on the removal of the source. But this one, how does he, how does he do it? How does the Buddha explain? He used this analogy. It's like a man walking, very, running. Then he says, why am I running? Then he sees, there's no reason to be running. Then he walks. But when he says, why am I walking? Then he look at, there are no good reason to be walking. Then he slows down. So it's through um, using in logic, uh, pure, theoretic, uh, intellectual reflection and realize that all this anxiety, all this restlessness, all these worries are unfounded. And then they just calm down and then gradually calm down even more, okay? If this still doesn't work, then you have to use sheer grit, um, um, grit, okay? And then this is a summary, and then finally he says, um, if the bhikkhu is very skillful in this, he can be said to be a master of his own mind. If you want to think something, he can think. If he doesn't want, he doesn't don't have to. We know this is a superpower, right? We know... Sometimes I say, don't think of a pizza. You think of a pizza. Don't think of a pink elephant. Surely you think of a pink elephant. It's like that. Our mind is like that. Like if you 
I'm sure some of you would have feeling like this is not a situation, it's not an important issue. It's not important. But you see, it's not important. It keeps coming to the mind. Okay? So, and then it just disturbs you because we don't have this skill. Okay, now let me um, talk about combat. Oh, before that, uh, I want to um, uh, sort of take reference from the author and also uh, scholars of the um, Buddhist teachings. You see, every time we read a sutta, sometimes it's not so clear. We need to take reference from commentaries. Some of the commentaries are written by ancient um, practitioners, like Venerable Buddha Gosha, uh, Mahakachana, during the, one of the Arahans during Buddha's times, uh, Shariputta also, Ananda as well. They explain to other disciples after listening to the Buddha. So who are we to interpret the Buddha's words so directly as if we know just because we can read English we are so we have to depend on the commentaries right so um, the translator of this particular sutta Somatera say that um, the removal of the distracting um, has well, this uh, brother Priyatan who said that this was translated by Somatera and Venerable Nyana Moli and Bhikkhu Bodhi translated it in the Middle Lang Discourse that was published in 2001. And, um, uh, and then uh, and the Chinese Agama, sometimes scholars they need to compare with different sources because Chinese Agama was collected in a different time during the sectarian Buddhist period, right? Um, under the, uh, in the northern part. Uh, so you sometimes you want to tally so that you know the Sabastaviras, uh, the the Mahasangika group, and later the um the Sabastivada, you know, all their collection. If you can find some kind of common denominator, maybe this is the part that at least is agreed upon by all the sects. Um but of course at the end you still have to commit to one of them. So for me. Um, the Pali Canon is my reference. Um, so, but you take all this and compare, then you can see this is agreed that it is it happens in Sawati. Okay. Okay, this one is uh um also quite important. Uh, it was um the this particular sutta is really about removing disturb distracting thoughts, primarily for meditators. For meditators so even though there are five ways to remove the distracting thoughts but the primary way should be the meditator should always go back to his primary object so when we are practicing anapanasati or four elements or 32 parts of the body or white kasina or whatever kasina we should keep the mind on those object whatever we distracting thoughts it have, we use this we apply this when Despite our best effort, we are still distracted. Uh, then we use thought replacement. We use um, uh, uh, reflection on that karma. You know, reflection on uh, just let go, or reflecting on the source of the cause, or just um, use brute force. Brother Pia also say that these methods, however, are effective means for mental focus in daily tasks like studying and working and in psychotherapy, such as the treatment for phobias. In modern psychological terms, these five methods may be respectively called thought displacement, aversion therapy, non-attention or avoidance, thought reduction or mental analysis, and sustained effort. I felt what he said was interesting, even though the original intention is meant for meditators trying to develop further in samadhi but this makes it maybe applicable you know applicable in daily life so i'm using this to explain what i know about uh, stress management and mental health promotion so i must caveat that this is conventional not may not be the, the buddha's intention okay so stress and stress management what is stress so to consider your stressful situation, when you say your stress, what do you mean? You know, can anyone say how would you? Uh, what is stress? 
usually in Dharma talk, we don't participate like this, but now let's make it worldly. Yeah? So now this segment is worldly talk. Okay. Would you like to... What is stress? <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Imagine one day you don't work anymore. Don't have to go back to work. Do you think you'll be stressed? My friend recently uh, resigned from work. After that, uh, she feels a little bit lost. There's an identity crisis. You no, know, nothing to do. Actually, there's so much to do. But after all, like I wake up in the morning, what to do today? Uh, nothing can be stressful. Huh? Okay. What else? How would you de define stress? <laughs> Ah, yes. When you try to accomplish something uh, in a very limited time, yes, so you have maybe five minutes, but you got ten items to cook to, to do. So you try to cram the time to do to the five minutes that you have. I think uh this put your your body into a stress situation. Yes. So it, I think we thought to either you did it all those not in the project based or increase the time. Extend the time. Or increase manpower, right? Increase manpower. I mean, if it's your own work, I think okay. cannot. Yeah. I mean, if it's a group, okay. If your own work, I think probably not. Very interesting. It's like uh, it it there are a few things that uh um that brother David right your sorry your uh, I can't remember your name. Uh, Charlie, yes, yes. Um, brother Charlie was saying, um. When you have a long list of things to do and that your time is limited, you either remove the things you need to do or you increase the time. Then I was suggesting that sometimes the time cannot be increased. Then one of the ways to increase your manpower, manpower require money, right? So, I mean, in those of us who manage projects, we, we always say that if I don't have enough resources, I can't finish a project. So, I was giving this talk not the Dhamma part, but the, the conventional part to a group of uh, seniors. And then one of the things they define is that stress is when you don't have enough resources to accomplish the thing you need to do. It's about resources. Um, so that was an interesting code notion also. But yet, uh, I, 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 uh, I have a friend who was a very senior official in MOE last time. He she works with Go King Sui closely. You know, there was once um uh there was a project that requires one year to accomplish. Then Go King Sui said, I want you to finish in three months. They say, I can't finish in three months. No matter how much money you need, how many people you need, you just tell me I will approve it. They say that if a mother if a woman takes nine months to have a baby, can a nine woman take one month to have a baby? <laughs> So, you know, there's some reality and some truth to, to accomplishing anything, right? So, anyway, there is a, there is a medical um, definition. It is a feeling or emotional or physical tension. It is a feeling of tension. It can come from any event or thought that makes you feel frustrated, angry, or nervous. So, like going to work on a Monday. Or when you retire suddenly and there's nothing for you to do because you didn't plan for it. Or that suddenly you've got lots of things to do and you don't have enough time. So um, it's just a feeling, just an emotion. Okay? In this, Medline is, um, is a medical education resource that we do. So it's just a feeling, emotion. But if you analyze it, how does this happen? It's probably related to not having enough whatever resources or time and to accomplish something so it makes it unrealistic in one way or another. Or the nature of, of like you want to grow a tree within one month, cannot ma. So this makes you very stressed. When we don't finish the tree, somehow you have to pay a big fine. That would be very stressful. Yes, yes. Yes, it's still, it is. Like nowadays the standard of living is so high, yeah. You, you have no extra income or you have limited income uh, and then the, the product all going up. So it poses a lot of stress to a lot of people, especially in our generation. It's, it's that's, a, why, that's why I see uh, in, if you go to NTUC, uh, you saw a lot of piles of this Maggie meal on display. You know. 
I mean, these are the most economic, economical food that you can uh, consume, you, know? you see? So, those manufacturers of this uh, Maggie Mia, they make money because uh, their product uh, got big sales. Uh. That's why. And, uh... then, and then this IT, uh, this handphone, all this stuff, when they go to MRT or bus, uh, practically 9 out of 10 are uh, always at, at the phone call, at the phone note. You know, whether it's necessary or not necessary, maybe it's a time to pass, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a mean of passing time, but I think it's probably you have to. Use this time to relax yourself. Instead, they go to a uh, handphone and you know try to catch up with all this. I I think this this modern stress life is very prominent in our life now. Thank you very much, Harley. Time. That is what I'm going to say later. Actually, the way we we pl we play with our handphone is thought displacement. Do you realize it? It's because there's a lot of restlessness and we don't have anywhere to dissipate it. We don't go to our breath, and then we just go to YouTube or whatever. That's thought displacement. In the olden days, people use alcohol, drugs, casinos, gambling. It's the same. And then after a while, it becomes an addiction. And it's all related to thought displacement, the first method to get rid of defilements. But instead of using a wholesome object, they use an unwholesome one. Some of the videos I would say are wholesome, but some a lot of them are actually rubbish. Lah. Yeah. But also what you talk about, about Maggie Me and Sing Siong and all that. Lah. Gradually you realize a lot of people spend their whole life making money. It is because they are doing their best to avoid stress. I sorry, yeah, you want to say something? Oh, no, no. Okay. So really, um, I mean, we cannot judge people who try to make money. A lot of time is trauma. You know? No money is really, really sad. Very, very frustrating. Cannot sleep at night. Very scary. Then they make a lot of money, more than enough, because their need is so deep. You know, millions of dollars, but when they, then they only eat porridge. You know? So it's, uh, when you look at it, looking at this, I think, I hope you understand why. Yeah. Anyway, can I can I make uh, can I make a, a, a yeah question? Um, you know this thing called white coat syndrome. Yes. So you know when you go to the doctor, you know then you get the uh, blood pressure goes up and everything. Uh, okay. Yes. So I, I I observe this in myself. Yes. Okay. Then my blood pressure will go up to maybe hundred fifty. Yes. But normal time is actually normal. Yes. So my doctor will go and try to prescribe me a. Uh, medication to lower it down. So I, I, I challenge my doctor, I, I put a 24 hour blood pressure monitor on my yeah. arm overnight, yeah. uh, 24 hours. Yeah. And it turned out to be normal. Yeah. So it only happens during the time where when you're stressed. Know, <laughs> stress, uh, huh? So I, you know, I try to wash my breath, I do all these things, uh, but still, before I see the doctor, it will be like that. Yes. Okay. So you know, maybe you can comment. Yeah, it's very common. Actually, all of us, uh, I must say, some of us, we thought, you know, when I was young, there are a lot of stress. Then I'm older now, I have, I'm established, I got a healthy bank account, CPF. I've got health, you know, and then I got a lot of resources around me. Wow, come on, I'm still scared. Why am I still worried of this and that? A lot of time is rooted in the past. Um, it becomes like a neural pathway in the brain. But I, must also, but I must say that this phenomenon of seeing a doctor we tense up is quite common. It could be, um, uh, I'm, I mean, for some reason, seeing a doctor, for a lot of people, is like a moment of truth. Like, what if there's something I'm discovered or like, because uh, we are very helpless at that moment. And it may not be true, but we are always, because of the past experience, right, we focus on the negative thing, the negative outcome. My own experience is focusing on the negative outcome makes us progress and achieve a lot. But when the danger or the negative things are no longer there, we still have this habit of focusing on the negative. This is similar to Ajahn Brahm's story about the two bad bricks, you remember? He said that he built a brick wall 
but there are two bad bricks that were not well placed. And then there was a visiting Ajahn. He was showing the brick that he laid, but he's trying to cover the bad bricks. And then the visiting Ajahn say that your brick wall is really, really nice. Then he says, but you didn't see this too. They say, I saw, but the whole thing is so nice. So there is a kind of um, uh, um, cognitive bias. We tend to focus on the bad outcome, the imperfection, the faults, in order to improve ourselves. This, we, we learn it since young. But when we're old, uh, we still think about the negative things. Then we, like or some friends or meditators for a long time, every time we talk, you just say that I'm very bad, always distracted. I just feel that you're very good. You're meditating every day. You're like, and so she always thinks that she's a bad Buddhist. But I just say that, yeah, I, I understand. I also have that. You know, it's uh, then the, but if you recognize this is a cognitive bias, maybe this is a way to overcome this help your mind to look at the positive side. Ajahn Brahm's story again, there is this uh, Winnie the Pooh and Piglet, they were out in the open and there was thunderstorm and both of them took refuge in the tree. Piglet was so scared, what if the tree falls? And then Winnie the Pooh says, what if it doesn't? That's it. When you think that, what if I got high blood pressure again? What if it doesn't? Or, what if I fail my exam? What if you doesn't? Okay, or maybe the chance of failing is very high. What if this is good? What if is what if this is the way the deva is trying to help you? You know, fail this is not for you. You know, say you're worried. You no, know, what if I got a stroke? What if you don't? Then you really got a stroke. But what if you can still walk? Ah, okay, then you rehabilitate. What if you can rest? Ah, you know, you can look on the positive side of every situation. Similar to the Zen story of the of the cup. Half full or half empty. If you're young and trying to develop, you it is good. All of us um parents and elders, they taught us. Don't always rest on your laurels. Look at the cup as half empty. Then we'll strive and we become really, really full. But we're always seeing ourselves as half empty. And even when we are old and retired and still seeing that we are inadequate, it's unnecessary. All these are just expedient. Actually, a lot of us, we, we live by concepts and perceptions without realizing that concepts and perceptions, they are just things that we need, you know, to develop. They are not truth. The truth is in the Dhamma. Okay, let's move on. I have, uh, I'm going to share with many things that I feel that some of your comments, uh, you can relate to this. Okay. So this is the autonomous nervous system. Um, all of us have got the brain and the spinal cord, but many of us are not aware that we have an automatic nervous system that we are not conscious of, like how our heart will beat faster when we're nervous, or the heartbeat will become slower when we're calm, or that muscles will tense up when we're under danger, or that we will start to um, you know, have stomach ache when we are nervous, or when we're very restful, we will start to want to eat. Okay? So it's all because of this autonomous nervous, autonomic nervous system. So during stress, the brain increases activity of the sympathetic branch. It causes us to dilate the pupil, inhibit the saliva, a cell heartbeat, all trying to prepare us to run. Dilate pupil so that you can see in the dark. Inhibit saliva flow so that you stop all this nonsense of trying to digest food. Okay, no time for that. Accelerate your heartbeat, dilate your bronchi so that you have more air. You stop the peristalsis so that you don't want to go to pangsai, you know, in the middle of a crisis. Then you increase your glucose production because you need more energy and then adrenaline will be secreted. You stop the bladder from contracting. So when you're nervous, you, even if you've got full bladder, you stop already, right? So this is a fight or flight response. Ah, when the stress is gone, when the threat is gone, we feel safe. The brain increases activity of parasympathetic branch. This is called the rest and digest. So it makes us like slow down the light so that we can sleep because too bright and cannot sleep, right? Sleep is important to cleanse the brain and of the, 
of the waste material and and help help to repair all the injuries, stimulate saliva so that you can start to get nourishment and then slow down the heartbeat because you don't want to waste so much energy, don't need so much oxygen. You make your bowel move so that you are hungry on the eat and you can pass motion and then you will secrete the bowel so that you can digest food and then you can contract the bladder to release water to get rid of the waste product. So all this maintenance happens when you rest. And then when you want to save your own life, you ask, you actually do this sympathetic. So one of them is to act and one of them is to relax. We cannot always be relaxed all the time. Okay? We also cannot always be stressed all the time. When the sympathetic response is high, the parasympathetic response will be low. This is like a law. When the parasympathetic response is high, the sympathetic response will be low. There's a seesaw like that. When the sympathetic is high, the red color one is high. S is sympathetic. P is parasympathetic. Parasympathetic is the one that makes you calm down. It will be low. Okay? So your fight or flight. So it's a, it's a rigid seesaw. Huh? When this is high, that is low. And when this is high, that is low. Okay? So this is important because when you talk about stress management, we make use of this bodily mechanism. So we talk about resources just now, you know, we need money, otherwise a lot of stress or no time, we increase manpower, then we can accomplish the job. So when you're stressed, huh, we need resources, either external, social, such as family and friends, money, okay, or personal resources, such as your emotional resilience, your physical health. They are mediators. If you mediate well, what doesn't kill you make you stronger. Okay. So whenever you use your resources, inner or external, and you survive, uh, wow, you can give talks already, okay? You can become a coach, you, as if you can write books. So we become stronger, and then we, we feel the whole world makes sense to us until we're suddenly struck with something again. Ah, really? Then our faith has been misplaced. So this is by Leonard Perlin. We still use his theory around stress management in caregiver stress and other, other situations. Very useful, uh, this model. I'll come to this again. The other thing is very interesting. This is a law. It's called Yerkes Dotson Law. But of course, conventional truth. Huh? Okay, so arousal, low and high. Performance, strong and weak. You find that your peak performance is when the arousal is somewhere in the middle. Okay, so you cannot be totally rest and digest every day. I think if you're like that, I feel self neglect. You're neglecting yourself, I have to report to APS, Adult Protection Service. <laughs> or if you're always so high, when you're so tense and so nervous, you cannot perform also. So you need a little bit of stress. That's why huh? go to Monday, go to work, very stressed. But when you totally don't work, huh? very stressed also because you cannot perform. Okay, Nothing you can achieve. So optimal stress. Some stress can be useful. So can you think of time when some stress is good? Anyone? Example? Can you give a live example that you can see? There's some arousal, but there's a smiling face. Some stress. Like, for example, for example, you are testing the game game. Yeah, yes, yes, indeed. When you're when you under stress, you tend to make more. Yes, yes. Maybe the maybe the quality may not be there, but whatever it is, I think. Yeah. Anyone else their experience? Holiday? How holiday, yeah? Okay. In what way holiday can be stressful? Not so stress. Okay. I can you give an example of a good stress? Like some stress and it is good. What about you? Arranging tragic, arranging hotel. Yes, when you're planning for a holiday, wow, a bit of stress, huh? but you makes you very alert, law, you know? Okay, I have a few examples here. I think here and there, Dr. Uh, sorry? Passing the mic, running here and there. <laughs> yeah, <I don't> <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so like when you're playing badminton, this, of course, competitive is very stressful, but it's acute. But when you're playing games, huh? like playing computer games, if you're not, like fully engaging in the game. It's not fun, right? Fully engaged, even though it's, you know, it's a game, it's fun, you know? If you're like Botak, 
like very mindful playing game, uh, then don't play. La. <laughs> Actually, meditation is also an example. Meditation can be a bit stressful, but just nice. Okay. That's why right effort is the sixth of the Noble Eightfold Path. Playing games on the chess, you know. No hawker. Sometimes they are very quick. Huh? Yeah, what do you want? Even though they talk very fast and not so courteous, you can see the joy in their work. Right? Farmer farming. Huh? Learning things. Okay, so um, I hope everybody understand that some stress is useful, okay? But we know chronic stress is not. Why? In response to stress, uh, our brain produce the CRH, the corticotropin releasing hormone, which stimulates the pituitary gland, the master gland that produces the hormones, that direct all the hormones to produce another hormone to cause the adrenal gland to release cortisol. Cortisol is steroid, okay, hydrocortisone. I think synthetic one is called hydrocortisone, natural one is called cortisol. Cortisol increases the blood glucose so that you can make use of the glucose for your stress, regulates your blood pressure, reduces inflammation. It also makes us alert. It's secreted in the morning as part of the circadian rhythm, our biological clock. But if you have chronic stress, it will damage your it will dysregulate, it will cause your immune system to go haywire because cortisol suppresses inflammation, but if it's always high and then your immune system always have very high level of cortisol, then it doesn't listen to instruction from your cortisol anymore. They will just go by itself and then you have a generalized inflammation because of the other hormones being secreted and it damages your hippocampus because this hypothalamus, the lower part of the brain, control all this hormonal system, is very close with our the part of the brain that make us form new pathways, new memories. Hippocampus is very small in people with Alzheimer's disease. Okay? And more than that, uh, you can see cortisol will affect a lot of organ systems. So this is one example. Uh, it causes you to have poor sleep because cortisol prevents you from sleeping deeply. You have a very light sleep, you know. And then the brain stimulates the pituitary gland to release all these hormones. And then um, the adrenaline causes the heart to raise. The cortisol disrupts all the immune system and causes poor sleep. And the whole body becomes inflamed at the same time become less effective to defend itself. And we age faster. There's a phenomenon called inflammaging. Aging related to generalized inflammation, causing us to have atherosclerosis, um, Alzheimer's, uh, atherosclerosis affecting the heart, the brain, and the kidney, cause kidney function problem, high blood pressure, increased risk of coronary heart disease, and stroke. Okay? And chronic stress damage our hippocampus. So this is our health, can affect and cause us to have always tension, headache, sadness, nervousness, anger, irritability. We have more acne if you're younger because it affects our hormones. And then muscle aches and tension because the muscles become tense. And then heartbeat faster, nausea, stomach aches because we, we cannot it suppress the peristalsis, but we also cannot because you get constipation, then you get stomach cramps, increase the risk of diabetes, either diarrhea or constipation, affect the menses and immune system, okay, chronic stress. So we know that acute stress is due to sympathetic nervous system, right? And it is related to fight or flight to preserve our life. And a bit of stress is good, but too much stress for too long, chronic stress is bad for our health. It makes us age faster. So how do we manage stress? So managing stress requires to know the issues, confront them and manage them, right? We need to solve the problem. But we, do you know the root cause? You know? So we need to understand the root cause. The challenge is how do we know, confront and manage issues which are too stricken with high level of stress? 
So by right, when you're stressed, you want to solve the problem. You know, you know the issue is not enough money, not enough time. But how much money do I need? How much time do I need? You need to think. Is it money or is it the issue? Like uh, my friend says, so this thing, even you have give me all the resources, I still have to take one year to produce. That has to have insight into the nature of the problem. Otherwise, you cannot begin to solve the stress. But the issue is that when you're very stressed, how do you know how, what to do next? You may just be so frustrated that you say, I need one million, you know. Then show me the budget. Oh, then you just write and then found that you are wrong. And then your, your reputation to your boss would drop. Okay, so we need to, we need to, we to solve problems, we need to understand the problem. To understand the problem, yet we are very stressed, we can't. So we need to relax. Okay? So how to relax? It is this, by increasing the parasympathetic response, the sympathetic response will calm down. Okay? So how do you re in increase the parasympathetic response? Any activities that can divert our attention away from the stressful situation can reduce stress, right? So we mentioned, you know, you can go to walk in the park. But however, some of us take to sweet food to release stress. Some of us listen to music. Some of us exercise. Some of us take to alcohol. But some of us do meditation. And it is proven that okay, this one, uh, um, I think it's not exactly this particular paper, but there's another paper that talk about how mindfulness practice increases the heart rate variability. That is, our heart rate, usually the rhythm is regular and fixed. Pop, 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 pop. Okay? But when we're very calm, like an athletic, you know, or very, our heart rate variability is pop, pop, pop. But there are tiny differences. Pop, 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 pop. You know, so a little bit of variability. That is related to the increased parasympathetic tone. Okay? So mindfulness can make the parasympathetic tone increase. During times of fight or flight, if you're mindful, it will come down. So that's why some people say you can deep breathe. When you deep breathe, you actually stimulate the bigger tone. Uh, this is not exactly mindful, but when you deep breathe, you need some mindfulness to be focused on your breath. So when the mind is mindful, it will calm down. So mindfulness increases the parasympathetic response and turns off stress. I'll show you another paper in a while. <clears throat> mindfulness balances the mind. It has no side effects. It can be done every day. Even if one day we are sick and disabled, we can still do it. Like I gave you some examples just now. When you're very stressed, you can take a walk in the park. But what if one day you cannot go to the park? Or say your mind, your stress, you like to listen to music. What if you are in a place that you cannot have access to the music that you like? They always play the music that you don't like. Or a lot of time, uh, we stress, we want to eat to jumwe or kwe chap, right? But what if you are very nice, you know, you go to a retirement village in Batam, then after that, you got a stroke, then you stay there, then you want to eat kwe chap, you know, everything is halal, you cannot. <laughs> so, our stress management uh, is dependent on our physical ability to walk and also money in the pocket and also people who understand us. So our, our stress management is dependent also of our intellect. What if we got dementia? Oh. So mindfulness uh, is independent. Independent of where you live. You can be living in Batam or in China or in India or you can be poor, you can be disabled, you can send Batam or that, um, yeah, if you're dementia, if you're always mindful and say metta, you can be a happy dementia. So same, uh, if you look at this um, Perlin's model or stress process model, stressor will use social resources, emotional resilience. So mindfulness 
is the basis of emotional resilience. It helps you manage your emotion so that it doesn't it doesn't go into that unwholesome state for too long. So emotional help, resilience help us overcome the stress off. <clears throat> so this is the paper that I was talking about. It's actually quite widely cited. It's done in Cambridge University. Um, I can't remember how many people. I think 600 over. They have two groups. Uh, one, they teach mindfulness. Another group, they don't. They just give them regular mental health talks and lectures. And then those receiving mindfulness training, of course, they are, they are calmer. And then when they go through the exam, after the course, they go through the exam. After the exam, they also check. And then they found that those receiving mindfulness training were also calmer during the exam. And one year later, they follow up. The effects persisted. Some of them regularly continue mindfulness practice. Some of them don't. Okay. So among all of them who went through the control group and the and the intervention group, and those with mindfulness and those just the usual, about 50%, 53% finish it, the, the question. And those who went through that mindfulness course earlier, one year ago, the self-reported psychological distress and mental well-being improved up to one year compared with the control group, which is the support as usual. P is less than 0 0.001 means uh, if I say that those with mindfulness practice, one year later, they will still be having better mental health. One out of 10,000 times, it, uh, it is wrong. But 9,999 times, this statement is correct. Okay? In 10,000 times. Okay. So the mindfulness participants also made more donations. That's also quite interesting. People who practice mindfulness are a bit more, you know, altruistic. Home practice have positive dose response. It means that if you practice more often, more likely your psychological distress is less and more likely you are more generous. Okay. So no adverse re effects related to self-harm, suicidality, no side effects. Okay, so this paper was highly cited to say that mindfulness improves mental well-being and the effect can be longer. If you practice daily, it's even better. Okay, so this is one to support the stress process model and emotional resilience. So mindfulness develops resilience. But what is mindfulness? So this one, we have to um, go back to the Dhamma. So from the Abhidhamma, okay, the Buddha talked about Sati, but he doesn't quite explain. Because I suppose you are with the Buddha, and then when you talk about mindfulness, immediately you are mindful. And then, but then I'm sure there may be some who don't know what is mindfulness. In the Abhidhamma, it's explained. Abhidhamma, I have mentioned before, it is not developed by scholars. It's obviously by people who practice. It could even be the Buddha's words as well as his senior disciples' words. Even if it's not his senior disciples, it could be disciples of his disciples or disciples of his disciples' disciples. So the characteristics of mindfulness that it is not wobbling, not floating away from the object. So there's an object. Okay, so all mindfulness has an object. Even if you're like bare awareness, you're mindful of this awareness which is a mind or you're mindful of the body or mindful of the breath mindful of the skeleton mindful of even the things i'm saying the meaning of my words these are concepts you're mindful of concepts and that is possible so that's so this is not wobbling not floating away from the object and the function is the absence of confusion or non-forgetfulness of the object so the mindfulness is being like not forgetful, you know, always attentive. And the manifestation, manifestation means uh, to the meditator, how does mindfulness appears to me? It appears like guardianship. You're guarding the mind and the object. There is a famous analogy in the Sangyutta Nikaya in the book that describes the 37 bodhipakiyas on the section of mindfulness. It is as if a man with a bowl of oil 
walking in between a dancing girl and a cheering and jeering crowd. And there is a man with a knife at the back. If ever there is a drop of oil that fall off this bowl, which is filled to the brim, his head will be chopped off. And then he's walking with this bowl and a filled with oil in between the dancing girl and the jeering crowd with the notion that if he were to spill a, even just a tiny bit of the oil, his head will be chopped off. This is mindfulness. It's a guardianship of the object and the mind. Proximate cause is strong perception or the four foundations of mindfulness. So all these are from um, the Abhidhamma. I can't remember whether is it the... Um, uh, the Dhamma Sanghani, um, but uh, it's, it's, it's from the Abhidhamma. So these four instruments is how we understand any of these things uh, called mindfulness, sati and all that. It's very hard to describe only for you the experience, but you still somehow need a finger to point to the moon, right? So this finger, to describe something so, so, so experiential, they use these four things. What is the characteristic? What is the function? What is the manifestation? What is the proximate cause? And you also, we know that the right mindfulness is the seventh of the eightfold paths. And in the, in the teachings related to Cheta Sikas, in the Abhidhamma, mindfulness is one of the 19 universal beautiful factors present in all wholesome mind. What does it mean? As long as your mind is wholesome, you will have these 19 universal beautiful factors. What are they? 19, I can list out to you, can wait, can, can take up a bit of time, but okay, but I still tell you uh, it's faith, mindfulness, shame, moral dread, non-attachment, non-aversion, tranquility, balanced uh, um, or, or um, equanimity. So eight already, right? And then you have um, uh, lightness, softness, wildiness. Okay. You have got healthiness, straightforwardness, these five. And there is another factor of consciousness. And in the consciousness, you also have these five. Huh? Softness, lightness, wildiness, healthiness, and straightforwardness of the consciousness. Okay, so all these 10 plus 8 plus one more, which is uh, okay. okay, I can't remember the one more, I missed that one. Okay, wisdom sometimes can happen, sometimes it doesn't happen. Okay, then there is this. So these universal factors are always present in all wholesome mind and mindfulness is one of them. This is very useful understanding. Okay? So mindfulness is being fully present, uh, that uh, you are not wobbling, you are fully present on the object. You are confronting and sinking in on the object. So your mind is not floating away, you are fully present with the object and not forgetting okay, the object. And you see the Chinese word jin xin, you know, it's the present, the mind in the present. It's guarding the object as well as the mind. It's like holding an egg yolk. Too tight, it will burst. Too, if you're too relaxed, it may drop and fall. And the object, if you're a meditator, practicing for samadhi can be your breath, can be the sensation of body if you're practicing direct vipassana. And also, when you're mindful on mindfulness of eating, you can be mindful on the taste, the texture. These are all ultimate realities. We use words to describe, but a meditator, you directly experience it without words. And also can be concept such as the words of the speaker, which is myself. The clearer is the perception of the object, the deeper is the mindfulness. And mindfulness is keeping the mind wholesome. Okay, I didn't complete it. So wholesome mind. Keeping the mind balanced as well. So in 
meditating, we know sometimes the mind is not balanced. In order to meditate well, we need to balance the mind with mindfulness. We balance between faith and wisdom, energy and concentration. Neither too stressed nor too relaxed. Too full of trust nor too skeptical. You need to have critical thinking and faith at the same time. Okay? We need to have energy and concentration and balance by mindfulness. And similarly, the seven factors and elements also need to balance. Investing in Dhamma is wisdom, effort, joy. You need this. But too much of this, the mind is wobbly, not mindful. So you need to balance with equanimity, concentration, and tranquility. But too much of this, you will fall asleep. So you need to balance. So it is aligned. I'm not saying that we need modern science to, you know, to, to verify the Dhamma. It's just that there's something similar. Okay, this science is not bad. Okay, I use the Dhamma as a standard. Okay. Sorry. So, what is a wholesome mind? It's a mind of non-greed and non-hatred. Oh. Other characteristics are faith, mindfulness, moral shame and moral dread, equanimity, tranquility, light, lightness, pliancy. Pliancy is your softness. Oh, I remember already. Tranquility has both tranquility in itself, part of D, as well as tranquility of the consciousness, all in all 90. Okay. Tranquility of, of, of the mental body, tranquility of the consciousness. Lightness of the mental body, lightness of the consciousness. All in all, there are six of these that are in, in pairs. Uprightness is about being completely authentic. So if you know that a lot of people ask me, how do you stay mindful in daily life? If your mind is always authentic, your mind is always mindful. Similarly, if your mind is trusting you're always you're full of faith shame and moral dread how do you live with shame and moral dread it's about being respectful shame and moral dread the proximate cause is respect to oneself and respect to others if your mind is respectful your mind is mindful equanimity balance your mind is balanced meaning you're neither too tight or too relaxed tranquility is like on a hot day, very hot, you go under the shade of the tree. <sighs> okay. So the mind of a mindful mind is tranquil like that. Lightness, pliancy. So you find that. So this is this one, this feel a bit difficult, but sometimes you can see, you know, when you're very tense, you try to meditate, you just relax and let go until the mind is really soft. The mind soft, pliant, light, wieldy, the mind will be mind. It's so difficult to tell you to be mindful, mindful, very difficult, but you can use all these others. Why? Because in the Abhidhamma, the Buddha taught that mindfulness is one of the 19 universal wholesome factors. And if you have this, you have that, you have that, you have that. So they're all together, come in one piece. So this is how we can apply. And yet, the Buddha usually seldom talk about sati on its own. For example, this in Samanya Pala Sutta, he always talks about sati sampajanya, right? Mindfulness and clear comprehension. He says, here in Great King, in, all, in going forward and returning, the bhikkhu acts with clear comprehension. In looking ahead and looking aside, he acts with clear comprehension. And, and so on. So, it's, it's with, in the Satipatthana Sutta, we also talk about clear comprehension. So what is clear comprehension? And why do I bring this in? Because clear comprehension and mindfulness, you, you saw the universal factors, it's not always present. You need to add that in. Huh? Clear comprehension is a twin brother of mindfulness. It don't always come together with mindfulness. It works closely in mindfulness, like the right and left legs. By not rushing into any activity, mindfulness renders a brief pause an open space for one to inquire into the activity at hand. If I remember correctly, I lifted these words. I won't be able to write so well huh, from Bhikkhu Bodhi's, uh, one of his works. But anyway, um, I also understand why, why mindfulness is useful. Mindfulness uh, is, gives us that moment to see. And when we see, there is clear comprehension. So mindfulness and clear comprehension. There are four kinds of clear comprehension described in the commentary text to Samanya Pala Sutta. 
the clear comprehension of purpose. Whatever you do, you need to know why you're doing it. And whatever you do and you know why you're doing it, you need to know what is the su suitable cause of action in order to do it. And when you know the object and you know what is the suitable way of doing that, you still need to know the subject matter, domain of practice. For a monk, it will be the meditation object of the breath of the body. For us, uh, if you're mindfully caring for your parent who is disabled, or you're mindfully tending to a plant, you're growing, uh, you need to know the workings of gardening. So this is the domain of the practice. True nature of things in the commentary text is if you're not mindful on the object, you should, if you're not clearly comprehending the object that's a breath, you need to be clearly comprehending of impermanent suffering non-self, the true nature of things. So how do we apply in daily life? Huh? We're not meditators, we're not monks, we're not because in the forest. What it means is whatever you're doing, you need to know you're mindful, and then before you come to this place, right? You wake up in the morning, today I'm going to BDMS. Why am I coming to BDMS? Because I want to listen to Dharma talk. Why do I want to listen to Dharma talk? Because Dharma talk is important, you know. Then you see about, gradually you realize the most important thing to do in life is whatever we need to do in order to die a good death. In order to have a good death, we need the mind to be habitually wholesome. It's not just last moment wholesome, it's habitually wholesome. And the best death is Nibbana. You know? so then you, you realize this is the purpose, then you come to BDMS regularly. But what is a suitable way to do it? No? So suitability, for us coming is no problem. I don't bring any precept. But certain things we do, uh, like you do a business, you need to know what is the right strategy to achieve, but also ethical, aligned with your values and so on of uh, morality and ethics and all that. So you need to know the purpose, the suitability, and you need to know the domain of your science and art of the things that you're doing. Ultimately, at the back of your mind, you know all these are impermanent suffering non-self. Conventional truths are just means to an end for us to create good karma. But of course, conventional truth can also lead us to bad karma. But you need to just make use of conventional good karma. But they themselves are in themselves meaningless. Okay? But it's meaningful because we're not fully enlightened. So we need to always reflect on this. So this is clear comprehension. With mindfulness, you can have clear comprehension. Without mindfulness, we are working like zombies. So how do we, what do we do if we cannot stay mindful? That is when Vitaka Santana come in. Okay? First method is thought displacement. Okay? You can go to a park or say you're very stressed. You, know? you can look of, you can think of any neutral object. Next time you try, very stressed, you think of a chair. Every time you have a stress, you automatically think of a chair. The stress will come down when the mind is replaced by a chair. It's very simple. A chair is just like the object of any addiction is just that it is not unwholesome. Any addiction is alcohol, sweet food, um, gambling. Uh, social media is an addiction. Recently, last week, uh, mightily, um, Dr. Subramanian just published, right? Young people, 51% got social media problem. Up to older people, 30%. So I think all of us would have this problem somehow. Okay, a bit of it. I know every morning my friends from my Happy Village group, there are a lot of social media things. So I'm sure the whole night they are surfing. Okay, so instead of social media can affect our sleep, I think of a chair. Okay, try that. Or just chant Namo Ami Tohu, Namo Ami Tohu, no? Amitabha, or Itipiso Bhagawa. All these are neutral and wholesome. But they may not be so exciting. Okay? but it's a habit. Some of us just might put on the breath. Or the skeleton, okay? Like, last time I used to go on TV and speak to a lot of people. can be very nerve-wracking. I just think of myself as a skeleton. Skeleton, trying to do some good, like that. Okay. But if it doesn't work, you can use this skillful means called Chan Pui Xin. Have a bit of... Um, you know, in Confucian ethics, sometimes I, the, 
I, I find Confucian's teachings are very close with the Buddhist worldly aspect of the Buddhist teaching. You know? We need to have some chi, tan kui xin, which means some shame and dread. It's a wholesome thing. It's about respectful. That's why when you go to China, they call everybody lao shi, lao shi. Call me bo shi. I told them I'm not a PhD. They call me bo shi. It's just a way of their mind being respectful. When you're respectful, you can learn. Japan, even worse, Korea, you know, all this, Vietnam also. So their mind is very respectful. So it's a shame and moderate. But sometimes people are practicing on the surface. It doesn't go deeper. But sometimes even this surface thing helps the inner thing. That's why rituals are important and useful too. So like this, uh, like uh, if you're in a family taking a photo, everybody will dress up. So similarly, if we are thinking an awesome thing, then remember you're a Buddha's disciple. Oh, okay. Then you're respectful to yourself. Then all the shame will come. Huh? Then, uh, so like uh, in a ritual, like the American soldier who passed away, these rituals are very important. Keep people who is in this funeral wholesome. The one that the Buddha says, if you still doesn't work, then you just shut your eyes. Don't see. That is like, you know, this, these two girls, you know, talking. One of them must be a teacher because this website is about the assailed teacher. Teacher being assailed you know, by the students. So they ignore the students. So you can be like a man holding a, a bowl of oil filled to the brim, walking between the dancing girl and the jeering crowd. You just ignore. So sometimes the mind is so stressed, ignore. Loud music from the village and you're trying to meditate, ignore. My phone, the prayer. So if you cannot replace thought, like people are very noisy, you send metta. But after a while, you cannot, then you're very angry. Then anger, and also my moral dread and shame. Mm, then you just, but still cannot, then you ignore my phone, the prayer. But if it doesn't work, you can use calming the thoughts by going to the roots. So this is CBT in a summary, cognitive behavioral therapy. The understanding of this is all emotion is will affect our thought and our behavior. Our thought will affect our emotion and the behavior. Our behavior will affect the thought and the emotion. Okay? So if we are stricken with stress, you know, nervous, anxious, you can challenge, you know. Your assumption may not be right. What makes you nervous? Huh? Like, what if it doesn't fall? What if it's not true? What if it's not as bad as you think? What if it makes you grow? What if actually is a good opportunity? What if this is the way the Deva is trying to help you? So this is to change your assumption. So you change the way you think, it helps your emotion. But if you don't change your behavior, it can still affect your animation. So you need to have a good habit. Okay, so say, imagine one of these days, we are very down and out, maybe depressed, okay, at home, don't want to go to work, the whole day wake up like very late and sleep the whole day, at night watch TV until very, very late or surf the net until very late and then fall asleep, then wake up in the morning and then just call, um, grab food and then eat all kinds of junk food and maybe even start to drink alcohol, okay. The mind is very down. Maybe the mark nine is down, but why every time you want to work, you think that it's useless or that nobody will employ me or what, okay? Then your thought can change. What if this is meaningful? What if I can get employed? What if working is good? What if this is a trial and challenge? This is a way I, I polish my parami. So change the thought. But if you don't change your behavior, the emotion and thought will continue. So you need to Back, clean up your house and make a habit to exercise. Even if you have no work, you go out in the morning, you know, you look for jobs. And so the behavior starts to change, exercise regularly, eat healthily, and then your emotions still a bit down, then you change, challenge your assumption, then and then keep your behavior well. So behavior is habit. I, um, recently there was a book that I finished, it's called Atomic Habit. Um I think it's very good. A lot of Buddhist teachings inside. But it's of course by somebody not Buddhist. Lah, but it's about changing, making tiny things in your life as a routine. You change your lifestyle. You will gradually change the way you think and the way you feel. Okay? 
But of course, it's not easy to change your lifestyle. You can try to change your thinking. Not easy to change your emotion, but sometimes you can. So like uh, singing, uh, like uh, doing things that you like can change your emotion somewhat. Watching a movie, as long as you don't break the preset. So it's like this, uh, the cat. Uh, ah, so angry. But uh, why is so angry? Uh? Yeah, then calm down. Yeah, actually nothing serious. Uh. Why not sleep? Uh? And sleep. Okay, so this is like that. Uh. So calming the thoughts. Ultimately, you cannot, then we use willpower. No matter what, I cannot scold. Sometimes we are so stressed, we want to do things really unawesome. We need to use willpower not to break the precept. Okay. I didn't cover about, yeah, I mentioned uh, the way to deal with stress is mindfulness, but we know, but difficult to do. That's why we talk about this five way. But more fundamentally is we want to avoid these challenges and that's why we need to have a a life that is free from remorse, which is not to break the preset. Huh? But of course, if we break the preset, we need to we need to acknowledge it and then uh, always forgive ourselves, okay? Always have compassion to ourselves, always have metta to ourselves, always have mudita to ourselves. Huh? That's why your chanting book was talking about that. I think it's very good. Rejoicing in our merits and then be equanimous. None of us is arahant, so we always do that, but we, it, no matter how bad it is, uh, we don't break precept. When do we seek professional help? When the mental health, uh, when the stress has affected us negatively, in what ways negative is the second paragraph? When ill-being affects our normal daily functioning, we require help of professionals. It's very common, many of us experience it. Last year, there was a published data from IMHOSO, Young people, uh, 19 to 29 years old, nearly 29% has mental health issues. Uh, and you find that as the older the person goes, all the way to up to 60 and above, the statistics improve. So the older people have less mental health problems. But in another paper, between 60 plus to 80 plus, 80 plus increased stress again because of disability and all that. So the car, the way to make an end of Dukkha is all taught by the Buddha. And the way is in mindfulness. But mindfulness must be founded upon um, sila, right? Sila, samadhi. Panya is when we start to realize the root cause and work on it. But I mean, it's not easy when your mind is in turmoil. So you need to use different skillful ways to calm the mind down. My final slide summary. Acute stress triggers sympathetic response in our autonomic nervous system as well as cause the hormones adrenaline and cortisol to be secreted. Acute stress is okay, can even be life-saving. Right amount of arousal is actually productive and good. Chronic stress is bad for health. Overcoming stress requires external and inner resources. For an otherwise healthy person, the inner resource is mainly our emotional resilience. The Cambridge paper proves that mindfulness develops emotional resilience. Mindfulness and clear comprehension is wholesome mind with wisdom. Wisdom solves problems. When it is very difficult to maintain our mindfulness, we can recall the teachings in the Vitaka Santana Sutta. The Buddha taught five methods to overcome distracting thoughts during meditation in the Vitaka Santana Sutta. So that ends my talk. And we are nearly 12. Sade, 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 sade. Sade. Do we have time for questions or any questions? <laughs> ah. The record. When you are mindful, uh, can you commit misdeed or not? Like you commit something not legal, you know, like commit. It's possible because mindfulness does not always have wisdom. We can mindfully, like, say, release a, 
a piranha into Silita Reservoir, you know. Wow, may you be well and happy. Wow, then the piranha just grow into a, a lot of piranha and then it change the ecosystem. So mindfulness needs to have wisdom. When you have mindfulness and clear comprehension, can you make a mistake? Wisdom have got shallow and deep. The possibility of mistake depends on the amount of wisdom there is. Purpose, suitability, subject matter, and what really matters. The four aspects of clear comprehension. I actually I do. I don't believe that there are good people or bad people. I believe that there are moments of lack of mindfulness and moments of mindfulness. So all people are just skeleton with wholesome and wholesome minds. But despite anatta, there is karma, there is cause and effect, there is existence of a being which is five aggregates causing through time of anatta, anicca. So these beings, because of the deeds that they do, then they have to be jailed or be punished with some things, you know. Even if they don't in the worldly life, they have to go to, say, hell or animal realms like that. But they are not bad or good people. Bad good people is sakadity, wrong view of self. I think when you are to if you don't know what is right and what is wrong, you need wisdom to know. You need wisdom to know right from wrong. When you reach the visual stage, then you can influence it. Mindfulness, uh, because the mind is wholesome, there is there is no wrong roots. Okay, there's no unwholesome karma. It's actually wholesome karma, but there may not be wisdom. But because of that, uh, you can still make mistakes. But mindfulness, I must say, your conscience, you can say your conscience is clear. But people can have clear conscience and do mistakes, you know. Are there any other questions from the <laughs> Uh, Doctor, thanks. Thanks for the talk. Uh, um, I I I just want to point out that, like for example, if I'm sitting here, uh, listen mindfully to the talk, and then, but I'm not aware that somebody is sitting behind, or somebody has come in and sit behind me. Um, uh, is it that I'm not mindful, or is there any awareness issue? Uh. Oh. How, how, how to define this kind of situation? Yeah, that's a good question. A lot of people say mindful means you know everything. No, we always have mindfulness on an object. Even, I don't know whether I am qualified to talk about bare awareness. Bare awareness, I didn't learn bare awareness. Being that fully aware. The um, Tibetan teach a lot of this in the Dzogchen practice. It's as if there's no object. But my own experience is the bare awareness feeling comes after a very good sitting when the mind is full of samadhi, emerge from it, let go of the breath. The mind is very aware, very mindful of, it feels like mindful of everything. But when I check closer, it's actually mindful of the mind itself. There is always an object of the mind to be mindful of. So you can be mindful of something and not be aware of something else. It doesn't mean you're not mindful. So a person can be mindful of, say, listening to a Dhamma talk when you're driving. You're so mindful huh, that you can actually get into an accident. Theoretically possible, but because you're mindful, you are usually also mindful of everything at the same time. Some people say, oh, you forget this, you're not mindful. Actually, sometimes it's not because you're not mindful. You're mindful of something else. Hi, Doctor. Thanks for your answer. Um, personally, I'd like to ask another question. Because you when you talk about mindfulness, it's about self-cultivation. It means being Buddhist, she's self-cultivate. Then um, how about um, if the other party is not mindful, but we are also mindful, and I thought of myself being like, maybe I'm too sensitive. 
like, okay, that person, I'm too mindful of my sensitivity towards that person. But that person isn't mindful of what he or her, he or he, he or her insensitivity. Yeah. So in this as a respect, what should my approach be? Uh -huh. give? So the person not mindful, does it hurt you? Um, at that point of time, yes. yes. I, I sort of take it that um, it's a reminder yeah. and I say sadhu to him or her like, yeah. for that kind of reminder. Yeah. So I actually give the perspective a bit of twist, twist to it. Yeah. Then there is no problem, right? No, but still the initial part, yeah. there is the hurt that arouses, I mean arises. Yeah. Yeah, it's very common, especially when we are putting a lot of effort. When we're very a lot of effort is very very strained. So the balance is slightly on the side of tension and energy. The way is that we we may not be as mindful as we think. We need to relax a little bit more. Then it's actually at the right balance. Then people, whatever they say, we know that it comes from a space of lack of mindfulness, ignorance, which is part of nature. Then we don't feel so hurt. The moment we are hurt, we're actually our mindfulness is not there. And we might be too tense, so relax a bit more. That's about it. Yeah. Thank you. Any other question from the floor? Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, just now you mentioned about the uh, circular mindfulness practice for university students. Yeah. So uh, some time ago, I attended another class to mention about circular mindfulness for uh, the corporate world to improve their uh, reduce their stress, improve their productivity, to earn more profits for the company. Yeah. Then the speaker mentioned something about it may not be entirely wholesome because the purpose of them attending this course would be to uh, you know, promote greed and craving and, and all that. So would you have any comments on this? Yeah. That means uh, circul mindfulness being stripped off the Dharma versus the, the mindfulness within the Dharma. Yeah. I must say that mindfulness is not always accompanied by wisdom, as I mentioned earlier. So, but if it is accompanied by wisdom, all these corporate PMETs, uh, they would need to explore why are they doing what they're doing. The clarity of purpose, the clarity of suitability will involve what is the strategy, what are the values, and what is the sustainability of all this. And then they, of course, need to be clear of the subject matter. And ultimately, they need to know what really matters you know, in the face of aging, sickness, and dying. But mindfulness, the secular way, we don't usually emphasize the clear comprehension side of things. But if mindfulness is practiced correctly, it is still wholesome mind. Wholesome mind is good karma, even though it may not have wisdom to it. I do not disapprove or discourage it. I think it is still good because the world is full of suffering. Even as a doctor, I give medicine. Medicine is neutral, what I will still give. Then a person is stricken with uh, mental health issue, anxiety, depression, poor sleep. If he's not a Buddhist, I will still talk about mindfulness. Then, but I will add in clarity. Clarity of purpose, suitability. All these things is also very useful to them, you know. And um, many of them in this kind of places, they start to realize that uh, it's helpful. Um, and they may even start to explore what is the truth that makes it more sustainable. And gradually, they'll connect with spirituality. And then maybe they will start to faith. Faith is very useful you know, for mental health. And maybe one day they will start to say that faith and truth is a bit different. And they may want to find out what is the real truth. And then they'll find that, hey, the Buddha's teachings is the most coherent of them all. And then they'll start to find, it, find out more. But mindfulness is not copyrighted by the Buddha. I mean, the Buddha never do that also. It's an aspect of universal truth related to human psychology, uh, being psychology, yeah, psychology of cats and dogs even. some I, I used to have this cat. Huh? I give the cat food. He would thank me first. 
and then he eat the cat food outside the dish before he eat the cat food inside. Even though I cannot read mine, I think there is mindfulness in that cat. So mindfulness is useful even for a cat or a dog or an orangutan, you know. So what more, you know, humans? And so I don't, I would even teach secular mindfulness if there's a demand for it.